This video is brought to you with the support of TrueFire. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World. We're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. The B-15 is perhaps the most recorded amplifier in history. I'd bet it surpasses the Fender Deluxe and Princeton combined. Since its introduction in 1960, the Ampeg B-15 has been used in every genre and in every decade. Producer Eddie Kramer remembers Led Zeppelin's John Paul Jones wheeling his B-15 into recording sessions. Stax Volt legend Donald Duck Dunn swore by the B-15 and Rick Danko so loved his B-15 that he used one during the filming of the band's The Last Waltz. Verdine White from Earth, Wind & Fire used one in the studio. Studio great Chuck Rainey used one almost exclusively from 62 to 82. And both Marcus Miller and Daryl Jones used B-15s in the studio early in their careers. Jones is quoted as saying, I'll be doing sessions for many years to come on both vintage and new models. Thanks to Jess Oliver for getting it right from the jump. Developed by its inventor Jess Oliver at Ampeg starting in 1958, the B-15 was introduced in 1960 as the first combination head and cabinet specifically designed for bass guitar. Oliver's history as an innovator at Ampeg includes being the first to add reverb to a combo guitar amp with their Reverber Rocket in 1961, fully two years before Fender would introduce onboard reverb in their Vibroverb in 63. In 58, Oliver started to design a speaker and amplifier combination that would set the standard for all bass amps to come. Like many sewing machines of the time that folded back into their cabinet, the B-15 was designed to fit inside its own speaker cabinet for easy transport. From its beginning as the union provided amp on the Manhattan bass club scene to its ubiquitous set presence in all of the top recording studios, the B-15 flip top was always there. So if you'd like to know more about the history and evolution of the most recorded amp in history, stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World Short History of the Ampeg B-15. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe or grab a t-shirt, hoodie, or a stomp preset pack to support what we do. And to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, sign up for the Friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. There's a friend level to suit any budget. The links are in the description. Produced from 1960 to 1980, I'll cover the evolution of this pivotal amp. Though a relatively simple design, it went through many, many versions over the years, and I'll cover all the highlights of that evolution. When introduced in 1960, the B-15 was priced at $355, the equivalent of roughly $3,660 today. Even given that this was both for the amp and the speaker cabinet, it was clearly a premium product from the moment it hit the market. Initially designed for acoustic basses, this initial model featured extra porting to capture the upright bass tones. These first models are easily ID'd by their distinctive power knob, shared tone circuit, random navy flare tolex, and the absence of a Lucite light-up logo panel. The circuit included two octal 6SL7 preamp tubes, a 6SL7 phase inverter tube, two 6L6 power tubes, and a 5U4 rectifier tube. These first amps were cathode biased and hence produced less power than the later fixed bias amps, topping out at about 25 watts. There were two channels with separate volume controls, but they shared an EQ circuit of treble and bass controls. The EQ circuit came after both preamp tubes and before the phase inverter, giving it overall control of everything headed to the power section. And here is one of the most interesting and powerful features of the B-15. The tone circuit is a Baxendall style tone control. The Baxendall tone circuit was invented by English audio engineer Peter Baxendall and was made public in an issue of Wireless World in 1952. From the start, it was a runaway favorite in the design of early hi-fi systems. In technical terms, a Baxendall style tone circuit is a shelving EQ with an extremely wide Q curve with a gentle slope. Without making a sub-video here on EQ styles, that broad curve allows you to adjust a larger portion of the frequency spectrum, but the gentle slope provides a more natural sound and creates minimal phase distortion due to the design manipulating negative feedback to create the boost or cut. Negative feedback works by sending a polarity reversed copy of the output signal back to the input of the amp. Did I lose you yet? <laughs> yeah, I read this over a bunch of times myself. In practical terms, it's this bit that you need to learn. Unlike most tone controls that are simply just cutting bass or treble, a Baxendall allows you to cut or boost. 
It also means that adjusting the bass control does not affect the treble frequency setting you've already set up. In the amp world, it was most likely most famous here in the B-15, but it was later used in a number of guitar amp designs as well, and lots of recording studio gear, and now many audio plugins as well. James Jamerson is said to have taken advantage of this tone control by setting the bass all the way up and the treble knob on half. Originally, there were two channels with three input jacks and an extra stereo input jack that sent signal to both of the channels simultaneously. The cabinets were loaded with a Jensen P15N set in Jess Oliver's patented double baffle design. The design placed the speaker between two baffles that were separated by three eighths of an inch. The outer baffle had a 15 inch cutout and a bar across the center of the speaker. The speaker was then mounted to the inner baffle, which was fixed to the cabinet. The inner baffle featured eight oblong ports that passed the speaker's rear wave output through the 3 8 inch space and then out the 15 inch outer baffle opening. The design allowed the rear wave and the front wave to pass out of the cabinet completely in phase. That first version of the amp only lasted about eight months before a few new controls were added. This updated B15 would be dubbed the B15N, N standing for new. <laughs> the N designation would stay with the amp for many years and through many new tweaks. The B15N had the same random navy flare vinyl, but now the two channels had separate bass and trouble controls, an updated negative feedback circuit, and a second jack on the first channel. This channel and tone control configuration would become the cornerstone of all B15s to come in later years. A few months into 61, the 15N received a very visible new feature, the Hallmark Lucite logo panel that would last until 68. It's worth noting that the late 61 into 62 amps with the random flare navy Tolex and Lucite logo are a very rare combination that distinguishes them from any other B-15s. I reached out to Truefire a few years ago to be my sponsor because I've used them for years. I'm currently having fun going through Joe Bonamassa's Blues Rock Masterclass. With over two million users worldwide, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced level player, Truefire has lessons to enhance and inspire your playing. Get 35% off courses using the promo code 5 watt 35 down in the description, or like I do, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. I really like Truefire, and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. I'd like to thank Truefire for their support in making this video. Now we start a parade of B15N versions. In 62 with the B15NB, Ampeg began using a distinctive blue checkered vinyl covering that lasted till 68. This B15NC was released late in 1964 and had the last of the double baffle cabinets. Oliver chose to move to a 5AR4 rectifier tube that supplied less voltage drop or sag. The early 15NC used Jensen C15N speakers, but by 65 they switched to a 15 inch CTS speaker with a very large ceramic magnet. The CTS speakers were much more robust and lasted under tougher playing conditions while delivering firmer bass response. In 64, Ampeg had also launched a smaller sister amp in the B12, and in 65 they had launched the B18N, a huge amp with an 18-inch speaker that was endorsed by artists like Pink Floyd's Roger Waters. The B18 is worth noting because though it was discontinued in 68, it made it onto the recording of The Wall in 79 at the recording sessions done in LA. Waters would later use a Fender Bassman 50 on the Britannia Row sessions of that record. In early 65, Oliver made a minor change to the filter caps, but Ampeg did not bother with a renumbering until mid-65 when they brought out the B15NF. This was the move to single baffle ported speaker cabinet structure. The introduction of the printed circuit board dramatically improved production times. They also moved to a single tone stack wired unit. As this style of tone stack was popular on hi-fi and television at the time, we're not really sure if it was a standard module that Ampeg bought and then didn't need to wire in-house or if they built them at Ampeg, but it's also it was an improvement on the time and cost for production. In 67, Ampeg would change the look of the amp, moving from the classic blue diamond vinyl into a smooth black vinyl with chrome trim around the speaker grill. The chassis was chrome plated and still had the light up lucite panel, so it easily dates that combination. This is the amp that my friends at Ish Guitars had and are used here on the playing examples. At the dawn of 68, Ampeg would make its last version of the 6L6 B15s. There were many changes and most evident is the disappearance of the lighted Lucite logo panel. The chrome was swapped for aluminum in the chassis and there was a move to a new script logo. 
Ampeg added a pair of switches labeled Ultra High and Ultra Low that functioned like a pull text style EQ, emphasizing specific frequencies by reducing the adjacent frequencies. The Ultra High was centered at 8 kHz, and the Ultra Low was centered at 160 Hz. 71 began the production of the much larger B15S. These used a solid state rectifier and a pair of 7027A power tubes, two 12AX7 and one 12DW7 in the preamp, and a 12AU7 phase inverter. Much of this design change was borrowed from the new V4B circuit. The 15S tone circuit includes a three way bass response switch labeled bass, flat, and guitar. That B15S is the amp that Rick Danko was seen playing at the band's last performance during the filming of The Last Waltz. In 73, they moved to using a teal style cabinet that featured rectangular ports along the bottom of the baffle board separated from the speaker itself. The final modification came in 75 when Ampeg switched to a grounded power cord, removing the need for the polarity switch. In this form, it continued until 1980 when it was discontinued so that production could focus on the new SVT and V4B amps. In 2011, Ampeg released an homage to the design that helped build their legacy with the B15 Heritage amp. They built two runs of the hand-built, hand-wired amps. I spoke to Nino Monoxilis, known in the business as the Ampeg guy, for having been the company's sale rep for over 25 years. The first run done in 2010 for the 50th anniversary was appropriate enough, 50 amps. Completely hand-wired, using uniquely sourced parts like custom transformers, they sold out quickly for $4,999. They followed that with a second run of 100 amps of the next year at $5,999, all of which also sold out quickly. Dino told me that even at these princely prices, they didn't do any additional runs because they weren't making any money on the amps. To meet some of the leftover demand, they then built a run of 250 units with printed circuit boards, a different speaker, black chassis, and at $2,999, you guessed it, they also sold out almost immediately. Interestingly, they featured two channels, each based on one of the most revered years in the originals, the 64 B15NC and the 66 B15NF. They even used the original circuit to the last detail. There was even a cathode bias on the 64 channel and fixed bias on the 68 channel. They also used the Baxendall tone circuit, the flip top double baffled cabinet, a diamond vinyl covering, and most importantly of all to me, the Lucite logo nameplate that lights up when the amp is turned on, letting you know that you are in the presence of B15 greatness. Understandably, vintage B15s can be pricey, and most have been used heavily throughout their life. These aren't the kind of amps that get set into the back of a closet and forgotten. So I called Ampeg to see what they have currently built that would get me somewhere in the B15 vibe without the big money or the maintenance headaches of a vintage piece. They sent me a 50 watt PF50T head and the matching flip top PF115 cabinet with a single 15 inch speaker. It's worth noting that they make this amp in both a 50 watt version and a 20 watt version. Of course, the 20 watt version would be closer to the wattage of an original B15, but wouldn't really do the job for any sort of gig or rehearsal, where the 50 can walk the line for both. And of course, the 20 would be an amazing recording amp, sort of the ultimate tube direct input preamp, if you will. We mic'd up the cab with a Shure 57. Now, before you go shaking your head at this mic choice, wishing you used a Beta 52 or some such, given that we're capturing this for video and you're most likely watching and listening to this on your phone, the 57 goes low enough for this use. One of the cool things about the PF50T head is that you can take a direct XLR output signal from before or after the preamp and before the power section without having a speaker plugged in. They must have a load box built into the circuit to keep the transformer happy on this tube amp without a speaker. We didn't need to use that for this application, but it'd be amazing in a studio environment. I then asked Chris, the main sales guy at Ish, to play the vintage 68 or 69 B15NF that they currently have, and then play something very much the same on the modern rig. We did our best to keep things as consistent as we could. Same player, same vintage 62 Fender Jazz Bass, gotta dig those stack knobs, into the Shure 57 straight into a Zoom recorder. No post-processing EQ, no reverb, just a mic'd 15-inch speaker cabinet and tube head. I'll give you three samples in different styles back to back for comparison's sake. <laughs>
ended up thinking that the modern head sounded great. Nice tube warmth and fullness with lots of modern features at a good price. And of course, none of the maintenance that almost every vintage B15 I've ever met needed. But you know, man, I really miss that Lucite logo panel. I guess I'm just a sentimentalist at heart. About 15 years ago, I worked with Dan Lurie to design and build a single channel B15 in a champ sized head. A friend built me a teal style cabinet for a 15 inch speaker to go with it. Not sure of which speaker I should use, I jumped on the internet and found the flip top forum. To my delight, I found that Jess Oliver had been answering questions there. I found his email address and wrote to ask advice. He wrote back immediately and with wonderful detail provided me with the specs of the speaker I should use. Oliver must have been past 80 at the time, but he was just as excited to talk about amps and amp design as he must have been in 1958 when he first cooked up the design for the B-15. Dino told me that though Jess Oliver had long since retired from the company, he was very involved in the design of the Heritage Amps runs that they did in 2010. Dino had the pleasure of meeting with Jess and said that as soon as you started talking about amps, the man's eyes became sharp and his face would light up. Man, that's just how I want to be at that age. If I missed your favorite part of the MPEG B15 story, please put it in the comments for everyone to enjoy. I know from experience that I can count on you. If you like this video, you'd probably enjoy my videos, histories on the Fender Precision and Jazz Basses. First, I need to thank Phil Conrad for writing, producing, and playing the intro and outro for the video. I knew Phil from his work in Noah Guthrie in Good Trouble, and also knew he had a vintage B15 to use for the video. I think the track came out great. Check out Phil's YouTube channel, linked in the description. I want to thank Dino Monoxilis for taking the time to fact check the script for me. Having people like Dino at Yamaha Line 6 Ampeg that you can get on the phone are in my opinion what sets that company apart from the competition these days. It's one of the reasons I work with Line 6. I need to thank the guys at Ish Guitars for working with me on another fun project. Chris told me that the B15 that they have in is the cleanest he's ever seen and he's been doing instrument sales for over 20 years. I want to thank everybody that stopped by the store and picked up a hoodie, a shirt, a mug, or a stomp preset pack. And in particular, I need to thank the Friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. It's the guitar community I've always wanted. You're all 5 Watt world. I just make the videos. Thanks for hanging with me until the end. Until next time, I'm Keith Williams. Thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt world. Mm -hmm.